Sweet. So as you said, I'm Jake McCrary. I'm going to talk about serverless applications using ClojureScript and Firebase. Quick little background on me. I'm probably best known in the Clojure community as the author of Line Test Refresh. This is a line again plugin that monitors your source code. When it changes, it reloads it and reruns your tests. If you're writing tests using Clojure tests, highly recommend using it. It's great. Um, I'm, I'm a little biased, though. Um, I'm also a developer at Outpace Systems, kind of doing marketing, cloud-based stuff. I've recently started advising an AI startup based out of Chicago about technical things. I'm not going to talk about those, though. I'm talking about serverless applications with ClojureScript and Firebase. And even a little more specifically, I'm talking about serverless games with ClojureScript and Firebase. This is kind of a hobby thing I've been doing now for a few years. I've kind of used these techniques at work and doing other things as well. Um, but it's kind of something I'm into. So what do I mean by serverless? And what do I mean by games? I'm kind of building games like this. This is Backgammon, if you're not familiar. It's a two-player game, turn-based. These are two different browsers uh, communicating with each other kind of through Firebase. Uh, I've written no code here that runs on a server somewhere. All of this is entirely closure script, going to JavaScript in someone's client, works from your phone. I'm not managing any database. I'm not managing anything like that. If this really took off and became super popular, I could just pay more money and everyone could use it. Um, so like, why? I mean, that gives you a little hint about why maybe serverless stuff. Um, it's really powerful, right? Like there's just less you have to manage as a programmer, as someone running this. You don't have to worry about scaling necessarily. You don't have to worry about storing data um, as long as you're willing to pay money. Um, it's also like super quick to knock out these things. Once you learn the technology, like you can rapidly prototype an app idea you have or some sort of game you want really quickly. Like you're not writing a lot of extra code. You're writing the business logic and the display logic. That's kind of it. I mean, and tests, um, hopefully. But that's, that's really all. Like you don't have to do anything else. Um, games in particular and kind of small projects, I think are really great ways to also learn new tools. Um, like, Backgammon's not changing as a game, right? Like, if I want to do some sort of new technique, use some sort of new library, I can write Backgammon, deploy it, it's useful, it's kind of small, I can keep my motivation up while I'm doing it, like the finish line is in sight, and then it's done. Like, I never need to touch it again if I really hated using some library, it, who cares? It's there, it's done. If I want to try something else, I can either go back and refactor it, I can change it, or I can do a new game. Um, so that's just a really powerful way of kind of learning new tools, like kind of small, digestible projects that they're not throw away, but you don't have to go back to it, right? You don't have to live with your choice, uh, which is nice. Uh, they're also fun. Um, most of my career, I've built internal tools, either at trading, uh, trading firms or kind of marketing stuff. It's not really stuff I'm using myself. It's not things I'm sitting around in my living room with my friends, kind of they're using with other people, um, kind of building something kind of fun. It was it's really enjoyable. Um, it's kind of motivating, kind of seeing someone smile as they play your game. Like that's great. Um, I know a lot of my coworkers kind of use these with their families on trips, kind of getting that feedback from people. That it's no, it's great. Um, it's also fun to kind of to build something quick and fast. Um, so what are the building blocks? What am I using to build these games? What would I recommend you use to kind of build these? games, or any really kind of single page application in ClojureScript? Well, obviously ClojureScript. Um, it's great. Like, we all, hopefully we all love Clojure, or we kind of think we love Clojure, um, or we want to love Clojure. ClojureScript brings that to the browser, brings that to JavaScript. Um, you know, functional programming, simplicity of language, um, the immutability of data structures, and immutability of what you're working in, like that's huge selling point to Clojure. That's a huge selling point to Clojure Script. Um, the language doesn't get in your way, right? Like, I think some people at the workshop yesterday made this comment. They felt like, wow, like, I can get a lot done in this language. Like, it's not holding me up. Um, it, it's true. So, like, the second thing is Reagent. Uh, Reagent is a minimal Clojure Script wrapper around React JS. Um, it really lets you build kind of UIs very effic efficiently. Um, it's really providing you two main things, and that's the ability to define React components using ClojureScript functions, and it also provides the reagent atom, 
which I might call a ratum sometimes during this. Um, and that's kind of a way to store state and then have your components react to that and change. Um, so this is kind of like as simple as reagent component you could define. Um, if you're familiar with other templating libraries in Clojure, like this is like hiccup syntax. So you're using the literal vector form um, to kind of look like HTML. I mean, you can see how this looks like HTML, right? Like it's, even if you've never seen hiccup before, but you're familiar with HTML, you can kind of guess what this is doing. So this is a super great way of defining your React uh, components. Um, the second thing, you know, is the, the ratum, the reagent atom. Um, it's just like an atom, right? Like you swap into it, you reset things, except when you dereference it in your component, like that's letting the component know, hey, when this thing changes, like add a watch, this changes, let's recalculate what needs to be viewed here. Um, yeah, it's pretty straightforward to look into it. So reagent's great, it kind of gives you these things. This is really all you need to build like an interesting application in a web browser, um, but it doesn't give you, it just gives you those. It doesn't tell you how to architect your system. It doesn't really say how many RADMs should you have, like where do you keep the state. So Reframe does that. Uh, Reframe's a framework kind of on top of Reagent that really is opinionated about like where do you keep your state. Well, in Reframe you keep it mostly as like a global atom, the database. Uh, so now, how do you change that state? If you're changing it all over the place, you're really not in a much better of a situation than you were before. Um, Reframe tells you how to do that. So if you're familiar with the Elm architecture or Redux, Reframe is similar to those. All of these projects have influenced each other over the years. Um, I think Reframe actually predates some of them, but everyone learns from everyone. Um, so Reframe, you know, it's helping you make single page applications, and it really does this by managing mutation. Like, Single page applications are full of mutation. If they weren't, they wouldn't be interesting. Like interesting programs kind of do things. Um, but you know, give you a change in state, you have change in the DOM, you're interacting with the world, your HTTP requests and things like that. Um, Reframe kind of tells you where to put all these things. So you know, it's isolating the mutation. How does Reframe do this? Well, I already mentioned kind of the global database. That's where it wants your state to be. So that's kind of managing some of that state. But everything else, like how do you modify that? Reframe gives you a loop. Um, the loop starts with this event dispatch stage. This is basically like a user doing something, like clicking a button, right? That's an event. Um, an HTTP request finishing, that's an event. Like something happens that something should happen as a result of. In code, this looks like this. Uh, anytime you see RF, that's an alias to reframe core. It's a, a short version of it. Um, so events are vectors. The first element of the vector is like the name of the event, the type of the event. So here's a join game one. Anything else in that vector is just data that'll be passed along with the event. So if someone clicks the join game button, dispatch this event, cool. So events come out of event dispatch. Now you need to do something with those events. So that's, that's the next stage of the loop. It's like the handle event part of the loop. So you write event handlers. Um, this is a somewhat complicated event handler. Um, so one way of doing this is these register event FX. And this is kind of like the lowest, one of the lower levels event handlers you do. Um, you kind of give it that name. So like that's a or join game. These are the type of events it will handle. And then you give it a function. Um, and these functions are going to get in some get in some data, do some work, and just return other data. So this is super easy to test. You know, there's no side effects, there's no mutation, just stuff comes in, stuff goes out. Simple. So this, uh, the function, this takes in something called the cofx map, and this contains some things in it, but kind of the main thing you'll interact with is the database. And you can see that's being pulled out a little bit later. The second argument is really the event itself. You almost always destructure this, and you just ignore the first thing, because that's just join game. That's the name of the event. Then you have the game data. Uh, these event handlers, they return, like in this form, an effects map. So event handlers generate effects. Uh, effects kind of get returned as a map, where the keys are the type of the event, sorry, the type of the effect. So this is returning two effects, a DB effect, 
and a Firebase subscribe effect, then the values are the effect. Mostly, a lot of these event handlers, like you want to modify your database. So there's a shorthand for this that you'll see a lot. This register event DB. Instead of taking the whole Colfax map, it just gets the database. You just, you know, you change the map, the database, just return it, and there you go. You don't have to have all the other ceremony around saying this is modifying a DB. So event handlers output effects, and then kind of similarly, you need to handle those effects. Um, this is mostly done for you. Like someone will probably have built a library to do an HTTP call. This is where you would do those as well. Like you return just some data that represents the HTTP call from the previous stage. Um, here's the one that modifies the database. This is probably what you're mostly doing when you're writing a single page app using a reframe, just changing the global state. So this is like super simple, right? This is, you just regf, regfx. This is in the reframe code, so it's not prefixed. You kind of give it the name again. Here's the effect type we are gonna deal with. Then a function, taking that effect, do your mutation, do your HTTP call, do some sort of side effect here. It's like this is where you're keeping that harder to reason about, harder to test code in your application. So the database one, it's dead simple. Just, is it different? Cool, reset it. Um, so the effect handlers, you know, often are changing your database. So if you're changing, the, if you don't change your database, this, this loop's finished. Like you're not you're just going to wait for another event to happen or process another event that's already on the queue of events or something. But the database changes. We need to react to that. And so like, that happens through queries against the database. So these queries are called subscriptions. You kind of register them like this. This is the simplest subscription. A lot of these just extract values from the database. Um, again, you give it a name, game ID, a keyword. Give it a, in the simplest form, you just give it a function. It takes in a database. Extracts a value, returns that. Um, yeah, there you go. A little more complicated is these other kinds of subscriptions. And you'll see these quite often too. Um, this one is a my turn subscription. So this has two functions. The first one is kind of called the, the signal function. Um, the later one's the computation function. Um, but so the signal function, this is kind of saying like, what does this subscription actually depend on? It's like if you already have other subscriptions, like for getting out me or current player, um, you want to use those, you want to reuse those. You don't want to like re-get into your database the paths to get those things. Um, like you already have this indirection. Let's, let's take advantage of it. So the signal function just kind of returns subscriptions, like here's what this rest of this uh, query will depend on. Those get passed to the computation area. Um, and then you do, your, you do your computation here. And this is what subscribers of the my turn subscription would actually get. Little syntactic sugar around doing it because you often have a lot of these. Um, so you can use this like weird colon less than dash type thing. A uh, little magic, you'll, you'll see both. Um, it's kind of up to you if you actually like using it. So I already kind of mentioned one reason why you might want to use like these, they're called layer three subscriptions. Um, subscriptions that depend on other subscriptions. Um, that's indirection, so you can kind of hide where is the current player stored in the database. Like in this example, like that's a pretty simple extraction. Is it really worth it or not? Eh, probably not. But maybe it's a little more complicated, and that could change still. And it's better to have one spot to change where current player is located instead of having that change all over your files. Um, but the, art, the other big reason is like the same player function. We don't know based on the slide, what that's doing or how costly that is to calculate. Um, all of these layer two, these green ones, like these simple extractors that depend straight on the database, these always have to run whenever the database changes um, because their output might change. Now this orange box, like it only needs to run if one of its inputs changes. So like if the same player is a super expensive calculation, we might not want to run that anytime the whole database changes. Like the database is changing all the time. That's where we're mutating our stuff in our app. Let's only do this calculation again if me, your current player, has actually changed. So this kind of lets you just get better performance in your SPAs using Reframe. Um, it's kind of like a nice feature of Reframe that getting better performance 
like, you kind of get this for free if you want to like use the other layers of indirection you already have, um, and if you don't want to like depend on direct paths. Um, kind of nice how that worked out. So let's say a query changes, the result of one of those extractors changes. The next step is calculating views. Um, you know, here's a view that's dependent. This is just a reagent component. Here you see that same subscribe that we saw in, like, in that more complicated subscription earlier. Um, so this is kind of like that reagent Radom we saw earlier, to kind of dereferencing it. Very sim looks very similar, except now we're just saying, hey, subscribe to this subscription. So, you know, if that game ID subscription changes, this thing recalculates, the output of this component changes, great. Um, so, if the views change, you know, the hiccup that comes out of those, what these, what these look like, kind of get to this render DOM stage. This is really just handled by reagent and react. Like, you don't really do anything here. It's kind of like, hey, it happens. Um, so, like, these two red boxes, like, those are the only spots where mutation is really supposed to happen when you're doing reframe apps. If this, this is where the side effects happen, this is where you change the DOM, this is where you do an HTTP request, where you modify your database. It's like all these other boxes can be easy to test, uh, they can be like, easy to reason about, they can be kind of yeah, mostly pure functions. Um, that's, that's pretty powerful. Like, you don't get that with reagent. This is kind of like why you would use reframe. It's like once you kind of get this loop, like you really understand reframe. Um, there are some other things with the reframe, and like, here are some of them, I guess. Um, there's something called closure spec. Uh, people might be familiar with it. It's kind of a way of saying like what you expect data to look like. Um, it is recommended, like when, once you start building kind of bigger SPAs using reframe, like think about writing the spec for your database. Like what do you expect to be at different paths? Um, what should the data be like? This kind of helps, it both helps you think about it and it's documentation wise, because it can get a little confusing. Like you have this one big global thing that stores everything. It's useful to spec it. Um, but also, you can kind of use another concept of reframe called interceptors to kind of enforce that database spec is always true. So interceptors, um, kind of similar to middleware or kind of pedestals interceptors, but you can have things run before an event handler or kind of after an event handler. And you can kind of do whatever you want to, like use these for cross-cutting concerns. Like, do you want some logging? Great, you can do that. Do you want to enforce spec on your database? It's the same, like your invariants are holding true. You can do that. If you want to like, capture the global database, you can like implement undo and kind of like scroll through your app, oh, fancy like, which everyone does and stuff. Um, Interceptor is the way to go. Um, in all these examples so far, I also have not been using namespace keywords, mostly because like, the game example I'm taking this from is relatively simple. At some point, your single page application is getting kind of complicated, you're having a lot of different views, a lot of components. There's only really so many good names um, for like events, like we kind of run out of them. Um, so namespace keywords can really give you back some better names. Uh, you can often use the namespace as kind of like context for like where the event's coming from or what the, what the subscription is intended for. Um, so use them. I mean, namespace keywords are great. Um, I've also kind of hinted that hey, like most of your state is in the global database. And I think that's mostly true. Like you should try to keep as much state in the database as you can. It helps with inspectability. You have one place to look, debugability. Recommend it. Sometimes though, you get in situations where, like you have like this extremely local component state, like maybe just a value in a text field and you have a lot of these text fields and that's kind of just annoying to manage in the database. You can still reach for reagent atoms. Like you can still do that. You know, here's an example. This is kind of uglier, I think, than using the global database type thing, but it's, sometimes you have to make these trade-offs. So, with closure script, reagent, and reframe, like you really have all the at least code libraries you need to actually build an interesting single page application, like ignoring building and things like that. Um, that's great. So that's cool. Now you can build like a pretty interactive, useful web app. Um, and that's that's a thing. But things are more useful when you actually persist data somewhere. And we can get that data on another device. Or like in a game, you can get that data between two players you know, as fast as possible. Um, so Firebase. Firebase is a useful kind of third-party service. 
Um, came out a while ago, like 2012. Eventually, Google bought them in 2014. It's kind of kept the name alive and kind of kept the products alive. It's kind of become an umbrella under which a lot of the other acquisitions have kind of ended up falling. So as a result, it's grown a lot from what it originally was. Um, some things Firebase offers, like they offer about 18 different products, kind of depending how you look at it, how you, what you count a product as. Uh, but some of the main ones, like messaging, so you can do like cross-platform messaging kind of easily. Storage, you know, if you're building these kind of like serverless things and someone wants to upload a file, like where do you store that file? You don't have an S3 bucket or something like that. Well, you can use Firebase storage. Yeah. Cloud functions, kind of a newer thing. If you're familiar with AWS Lambda, you know, like running little JavaScript snippets and other things in the cloud, that's what Cloud Functions is. For the type of things I'm talking about, like you're mostly going to use the hosting and real-time database uh, type features. So Firebase hosting, it's what it sounds like, right? Like here's a way to host static assets, your JavaScript, um, your CSS, all this stuff, like just on a global CDN, get super fast delivery of things, free SSL, so that's good. Um, it also gives you a single command to deploy. If you just Firebase deploy, it kind of pushes all your things out there and you'll see the change pretty quickly. Firebase real-time database. This is really the more interesting product that like, I'd recommend using for doing these serverless closure script things. Um, and this is one of the Firebase's like, earlier products. Um, it's a cloud-hosted, kind of like NoSQL database. Uh, you can model it in your head as basically like a JSON object, and you're operating on like, key paths in it. Um, it syncs data between devices like, within milliseconds. Like if you notice on that backgammon image from earlier, I mean like both those images were kind of seeing the same thing pretty quickly. You could barely tell it was like not the same thing. Um, I mean that's all Firebase. So super useful for storing state up there, syncing things between devices. Um, it's great. Also, kind of because it came out of being like a mobile backend as a service, it does handle bad internet pretty well which is less useful for a multiplayer game because everyone's kind of playing at the same time. Um, but if you're building your own SPA for like tracking the weight you're lifting or your food you're eating or something, um, it does keep like a local database cache kind of on the device. You can still make changes to it. Um, as long as you don't like close that browser window, like it will like, resync when it kind of reconnects. Um, so we're not going to use everything from the Firebase real-time database that it offers in doing like this backgammon application, but we'll, we'll touch on a, a few aspects of it. Um, the first thing like you'll do when interacting with this is you need to initialize. So you grab this massive blob of configuration from the UI and you just kind of initialize your app. So this is closure scripts interrupt with JavaScript. Really easy to do. I mean, as straightforward as interrupting with Java. Um, Initialize your app once. I mentioned that you're really operating on paths, like key paths inside this JSON object. Um, so you need some, we need some functions to do that. So the DB ref, this is you know it's grabbing the database instance. It's getting, it's making a reference, kind of to a path. Um, so that's what we'll be operating on the value that's at that path. We need a way to save data. Um, so this again operates on a reference made from dbref, is called set. Just like, basically associate this data into this map. Um, I've kind of cheated in a lot of these games I've built, not all of them, but this backgammon one I did. Um, and I'm really serializing to Eden, the closure data that I want to persist at a path. Um, this is nice, because it hides the limitations of the Firebase like fire real-time database from you. Like, now you can persist sets. That's great, I love using sets. Um, so it's kind of cheating, but it works. You also need a way to get data out, and this for doing games, kind of interesting stuff. There's more than one person doing something. Um, you want to subscribe. It's, this is kind of like adding a watch to an atom enclosure. Um, so again, it's something working on a reference, you're subscribing. As this data changes at that path, you get a snapshot. If you get a snapshot, deserialize it and then dispatch a, re a reframe event. Um, kind of get that data back in your system. So this is an example of an event 
that's not user triggered um, and reframe, but something else happening. So with all those, like now we can take our building blocks, we can build a beautiful parrot. Um, and so yeah, so let's do that. Uh, so this next part, kind of like glossing over some steps. So it's kind of like, you know, draw, how you draw an owl, you draw some circles, then you have an owl. Um, uh, so it would kind of be like this, but this should definitely get you started. Like I think you could leave here, relook at these slides, and be like, oh, I can make a little app. Um, so step one, make a new project. Right? That's where everything starts. Um, you know, use a template. Um, Zach mentioned earlier, like, hey, you know, like build on top of what other people have built. Like, don't start from scratch. That's starting from scratch is expensive. Uh, I will say, starting a closure script project from scratch using Line again is expensive. You have to look at a lot of documentation. You have to know a lot of things that go in there. There's just a lot of configuration you have to do. I think maybe anyone does that once in their closure script life, and then you just like copy and paste from previous ones, or you find a template that you like, and you just start from there. Um, so. If you're not familiar with Line again or templates, this is using the reframe template, making a project called BG, kind of adding in this refresh thing, which we'll see a little bit later. So templates are great, they save you a lot of ceremony, but you will almost always disagree with something or they'll be out of date with dependencies, so update your dependencies. For here, um, we're also not gonna write any closure code, right? This is gonna be entirely in the browser, so let's just delete the closure directory. We're also not going to write any macros, so this is cool. Um, these next two are kind of related. Like core namespaces are terrible. Um, try not to have a core namespace. They are particularly bad in ClojureScript uh, because it makes like everything is a core namespace, and like even Closure. Uh, sorry, stack traces. You will thank yourself if you stop having core namespaces in ClojureScript. Stack traces are easier to read. Printing at the console is easier to read. I actually don't think main's a better name. Like, it's only a better name here because it's not core. Um, anyway, don't do core namespaces. Uh, if this was a multi-segment project, like, I would just call this backgammon, right? Uh, but single segment namespaces are also not great. Um, add Firebase. We need to use Firebase, just drop in this dependency. Cool. So we've screwed up the template now, so let's make sure it still builds. Um, if you're doing closure script, uh, you, you should be familiar with Fig Wheel. Um, it's amazing. Like, I really like test refresh because I get super fast feedback from my tests. I love Fig Wheel because I get super fast feedback from like, changing stuff into the browser. So right here, this is gonna spin up a server, it compiles your closure script code, kind of serves it up to you, and then you have this like, beautiful uh, template page. This is how it starts. Reframe's cool, because like here, we're editing this default component that came with the root thing, change it to say yo, and woo, there it goes. Um, that's, that's extremely powerful. Uh, like once you get kind of used to these feedback cycles and changing what you're working on and seeing that instantly reflected in a browser, um, that is addictive. Like this is partially why like closure script front end projects are fun. Um, similarly, like you change your CSS and that immediately loads. Like if you're doing any sort of like front end stuff, and you don't have tools like this, you should try to find tools like this for whatever language you're doing. Um, it's, like I hate to say life-changing, but, but it makes it way more fun. Feel weird, like, uh, it is life-changing, I guess, like we spend our lives programming stuff, so in a way. Uh, Figma also gives you good errors, like here I like starts up, deploy it. Like figure out how you're gonna deploy, deploy early and often. Um, you don't wanna like finish the whole thing and then have no idea how you're gonna like have someone use it. So just like get deployment done. Like, get that done early so you can like push it out there and have people try your stuff. Um, so to deploy here, we're gonna use Firebase hosting. So sign into Firebase. Probably everyone here has an account already, you just might not know it, assuming you have a Google account somewhere. Um, so yay that, I guess. Um, make a new project, get that massive configuration map from earlier. I thought this was kind of hard to find. It took me longer than like, I'd like to admit, really. Um, so here's a little image. If you log into your project, click that rightmost button or whatever and 
there you go. Just copy and paste it somewhere else. You'll need it for doing any sort of Firebase stuff. And now once you do this, like you're done. No more UI, like you, don't, you just don't need it anymore. Uh, install the Firebase command line tools. Initialize your project. Um, it's gonna pop up a lot of stuff. Basically select a database and hosting. Um, it's gonna ask you some questions. You just say yes to all the default answers, except it will say like, hey, what's your public directory? And this is what Firebase hosting is gonna deploy when you say deploy. So change this to where the build's gonna go, which in this case, if you're using this template, it's gonna be resources public. Uh, build your stuff using land again again, and then Firebase deploy. And then Firebase deploy does a little bit of work. It takes like a second or two. Then it gives you a URL. You click that URL and pop it open. You can see your template here. Unfortunately, it doesn't say yo, but it's fine. So now, like, you're all ready, right? Like you have stuff to build, you have fig wheel, you get fast feedback. Kind of the next step, I think, in any sort of SPA with reframe is figure out, kind of like, get some sort of idea what you want your database to be shaped like. Now, I think the best way to do that with some of these games is to start implementing game logic. Like how do you represent a game? What does a player mean? Like what is a turn? How do you move? Um, this is at least the most like, concrete way of me, for me to figure out like, what my reframe database will look like. Um, so I also do this in CLJC files. Um, this is kind of like a weird thing. I know a lot of people, if you're doing a pure closure script thing, might not think to use CLJC. Um, I like doing it because it lets me use closure tools um, while I'm doing closure script. So like, I think the closure, the closure environment is nicer for like running tests. I can use test refresh. Look how fast that is. Oh man, so quick, notification. It's great. Um, anyway, it's like a weird side part, but like think about it. Um, you really, like, like for this, there's no piece of code that I wrote that does not work in both closure and closure script. And like most of the code I've written for these type of things, like business logic, that's entirely true. Um, especially with some of the changes to closure script that have happened over the last year or so. Okay, so now you've thought about your database, you have an idea what that's gonna look like. Next, like start implementing some views. Um, if you're making a game, I like to start with like a join game screen. If you're making something else, maybe also start from the entry point to it, just because you can like concretely think about that and kind of start building out things, kind of make it interesting to look through. Um, there's kind of a little bit too, re too much reagent to like look at this whole thing. So let's just kind of zoom in on the new game button, which we've kind of already seen, I think. Um, so like, here's the new game button, right? So like, I'm, st I'm starting to build this view. Let's just build this single button. As I'm building the button, I realized, oh, I need an event. Um, it's like something has to happen when you do this. It's like, add that event in. Um, it's like, when you're kind of starting outside with these views, you kind of start digging into it. And it's kind of like, this will really help you to figure out like, what events do I need to have in my system? You start building these events. Now you can start making the event handler. I mean, there's the event. You know, you make the event handler. We've already looked at this somewhat. Oh, what do I need to implement from here? Like what hasn't happened yet? Well, this Firebase subscribe. We haven't looked at this yet. This is like a custom effect handler. Um, let's dig into this a bit. So this is a little more complicated than that DB uh, effect handler, right? Um, there's more code here, more interaction with Firebase. It's grabbing the DB reference. It's using some more of the API to kind of get the current value that's at that path. You know, it gets the current value. If the value's there, cool, just dispatch an event. If it's not there, let's save some default stuff there, like kind of initialize our shared state. Um, and subscribe, get all updates to this path. Um, so, unfortunately, like I didn't really have an example in here of needing to subscribe to data. Like as you build out your views, you also realize like what data do I need to write this view? That's when you can write your queries. Like, oh, I need to subscribe to something, I need this here. Okay, write the subscription that enables that. So now this is like, that was a lot of the owl being built. Now I've played the game. Um, start using your thing. Start having your friends, your coworkers, play your game, interact with your, like your non-game app, get that feedback, iterate, change things, figure out what you missed. There's probably some bugs. Um, probably forgot a feature. Uh, so, like, you know, do that. 
So it's kind of like general kind of tips from writing a lot of these kind of single page applications. Um, kind of highlighted one of them already, but like feel free to use closure tools and write CLJC files. Like you don't, you're not stuck writing closure script. Ah, oh man, that sounded so negative. You're never stuck using closure script. It's, it's great. <laughs> um, like use CLJC. Like use line test refresh if you like using it, or use other plugins that you just don't have in closure script. Um, really lean on fig wheel error messages. Um, like when I was redoing this uh, game for here, like kind of start hacking on stuff. I just kind of write like hopeful code, like what I want to be there. And then, you know, Figma would yell at me, because like, oh, that function's not implemented. Okay, go implement that function. Like, you, let your tools kind of drive what you need to do. You don't have to remember so much then. Just like, you know, think about it. Um, mention this briefly, but you will probably have to debug some things. It's like refresh. This is a great reframe tool um, for kind of like inspecting what your database looks like. Um, that bigger grayish white block, I mean, that's my current AppDB. That like middle thing, bluish move piece sync, move piece sync area, I mean, those are the events that are happening in the system, like as you click around. Um, like one of the great things about Reframe is that everything that's happening is so inspectable. Um, like you know every event, you can know because of interceptors, every event that's happening in your system. Because all your state is stored in one global atom, basically, you can look at all your state. Like this is huge for debuggability. Like back when I used to just use Reagent for doing these things, like it's way harder to know what's going on. Um, like this is this is super useful. I mean, when I did a lot of Reagent stuff, like you st I still just had one global database a lot of times. Like you kind of move that way, and like that's why I go to Reframe. Um, there's also Reframe Trace, which is like a competing thing with Refresh. They're both good. Uh, I just like the styling of Refresh a little bit better. You know, superficial. Um, so just a quick review, like, this stack is super compelling for building an SPA in ClojureScript. Like whether or not it's serverless or not, like this is highly recommend this stack. Um, like I've used a lot of the ClojureScript tools for doing these and I keep coming back here. Um, the tooling, like I mean fig wheel, auto code building, things like that, super fast feedback. I mean Clojure, Clojure and ClojureScript Amazingly fast feedback cycles. Like this is really what keeps me, I think, one of the main, main reasons I keep using this language. Um, you have the REPL, which I didn't talk about at all here, but REPL's, real, REPL's nice, fig wheel, test refresh, things like that, like it's amazing. Um, Firebase, there's a lot of stuff with Firebase. I mean, there's a lot of things I've never used at Firebase. Like, there's 18 products, I'm not, I'm not gonna try all 18 of them. Um, but it's a pretty great tool for like kind of serverless stuff. Like it's real powerful having this mobile backend and just not having to think about it, really. Like just, okay, how do I get data there? How do I get data out? Done. Like that whole Firebase namespace for this project is, I don't know, like 30 lines of code maybe? Like if that, um, it's, not, it's not that bad. If you want some more resources kind of in these areas, um, the Clojure and Slack. Um, if you're not in there, you should join. It's a useful Slack channel, Slack team, I guess. Uh, the reframe and reagent rooms are really helpful. Um, I mean, I'm there, there's a lot of people there, maintainers are there. They're pretty active, so it can get a little bit noisy somewhat, but that's fine. Like, I've learned a ton just hanging out there. Um, the reframe repo has a near excessive amount of documentation in it. Uh, like, not just the readme, but like entire docs directory. Like, it's probably the best documented closure project I can think of. Um, like, highly recommend reading that. It'll touch on some more of the advanced stuff that I did not have time to go over. Um, Eric Normand, he's been writing some great articles about Reframe over the last year or so, over on Purely Functional TV. Um, they're, they're really solid. Like, they're articles that I wish, like, I wrote myself. They're great. Um, he also has a class on it, which I have not taken, uh, mostly because I, I don't think I'm the target audience, um, but it's probably good. Like, I like his other stuff. Why wouldn't it be? Um, all the code for this is at my GitHub, uh, jakemcc slash backgammon. Um, it will probably evolve as I like tweak some, like I have some other ideas I want to try out, um, but it's there. Feel free to mess around with it. Um, yeah, so thanks. I mean, go out and build something. Like, it doesn't have to be a game. I think it should be a game, but it can be whatever. It's, it's so much fun. Um, here's my various contact stuff. Feel free to reach out.